All right, welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, we're happy to have such a, a full crowd here today. today. So uh, thank you all for coming. We're very excited. On behalf of West Health, I'm Roger Kisson. And as I said, we're very excited to unveil the findings of the West Health Institute NORC Survey on Aging in America. And it isn't just some run-of-the-mill survey. We did something I think you'll find unique. We looked at aging of American, reviews of aging of Americans 30 and older, and we did it decade by decade. In other words, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and so on. You could fill in the rest of the two groups, right? <laughs> this is a smart crowd, I know that. Um, so we tried to look at that, and we actually we did. We didn't only try, we did look at, look at those things, and we tried to compare and contrast their views. Are people who are 30 years old have the same concerns as somebody 60 or 70? And when do those, uh, 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 common, when does common ground separate? When do issues start to emerge that there are differences between how the age groups look at the uh, different uh, issues as they relate to aging? So we are uh, on live stream, so we have people who are watching at home, their office, and we'll invite their questions. Uh, we have, uh, you all have packets which contain uh, the news release about the findings, which has uh, been in a lot of places today, you might have seen in the news. Uh, but the issue briefs give you a more in-depth view of the findings that we have. And those on live stream can go to westhealth.org to download those uh, issue briefs. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce, you see our panel here, but I'm going to let you think about who they are. I'm not going to introduce them all right now. But I do want to introduce uh, the chief medical officer of West Health, uh, who, uh, who, who runs the West Health uh, Institute, who's going to unveil these very, these very interesting findings. And we hope you'll join the conversation later when we uh, talk to the panel. Dr. Aga. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and, and thank you for everybody for filling this house. Uh, I'm excited uh, to represent uh, the whole team uh, that is engaged in doing this work. One question, why are we doing this now? If you think about what's happening in our country, it's a critical time for aging, and especially successful aging. We know that 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. We know also that our population is going to go from 12% above 65 to 20% in the next 15 years. When I talk to my collaborators and when I talk to patients and when I talk to other seniors, it's also very clear that the, today's healthcare system, the way we have designed and developed it, is not addressing all the needs of our seniors. We also know, as we think about the work that has to happen, that we need to evolve and create more patient-centered, senior-centered models of care. With that backdrop, I also want to touch upon a little bit about West Health. West Health's core mission is to support successful aging. And as we define successful aging, we think about enabling seniors to have access to, of course, high quality health care, but also social services and supports, to give seniors the opportunity to age in place, to maintain their dignity, to maintain their independence, and of course, quality of life. These are some of the key areas of focus for West and our research. We do our work through three capabilities or three organizations. The West Foundation, which provides outcomes-based philanthropy and grants to organizations that are providing services to seniors. The West Health Institute, which is an applied medical research organization that conducts research to build evidence and also to disseminate evidence around models of care that are more senior focused. And the West Health Policy Center in DC uh, that conducts both policy research and advocacy on behalf of seniors. So what were our, our sort of main objectives for this survey? Uh, we wanted, if you think about the seniors and the aging experience, there are other surveys that have looked at what seniors think about aging. We want to take a step back and think about other uh, ages, including 30 to 40, 40 to 50, like Roger said, for two reasons. One, these people are involved in the aging experience through either their family members or caregivers, but they're also going to be the seniors of the future. And so we wanted to get a landscape view of across the generations. 
We did the survey with our partners from NORC, and some of them are over here, and I'd like to thank them for their collaboration. Uh, to conduct a survey using their Amerispeak panel and identified over 3,000 respondents. We conducted the survey last year in September and October. Uh, and the goal from some of the, uh, the, the results is to help us also inform programs, policies, and actions that we can take and all of you can take. Just a little bit about the survey instrument itself. It's a 50-item instrument that is designed to address four critical areas. Personal priorities now and in the future, state of seniors in America today, personal experiences with seniors and aging, and of course, healthcare experiences. The survey was administered through a web interface and phone calls, and we had a successful uh, completion rate of 46%. So let's talk about the results. One of the things that was very stark and revealing to us was issues around worries. When asked about worries about the system and healthcare and what they expect, 70% of all respondents felt that the country was not prepared to deal with the types of services that are needed for seniors. We also asked them about if they felt overall as a nation we were headed in the right direction. So we may not be prepared today, but are we heading in the right direction to make those improvements? And we found that almost 60% felt that what we are doing right now is not taking us in the right direction in terms of supporting seniors, specifically around things like healthcare, social services, and supports. We also wanted to dig around some of the personal uh, concerns at the individual level uh, that people may have around aging. And it was fascinating to see that amongst the three top concerns, and these are pretty consistent across the decades, memory loss was on everybody's mind. Of course, financial security is a big issue, and so are health problems. We do see that there's some difference between the younger generation and the older generation in terms of finances are more important for the 30 to 40 and 50 age group, and independence and, 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 and memory are more important for the older age group. You know, when we, when we sort of, as a physician, when I practice medicine, and Tim has said this line before, we, all, we often ask people, you know, what's the matter with you? Uh, what we should be asking is, what matters to you? And if you think about what matters to seniors and what matters to Americans when they think about aging, we found some fairly common themes. Health, of course, matters to everybody, and that is the number one theme. Uh, we found independence as a really important theme emerge. Uh, and respect, closed relationships. So these were some of the common themes that came when we talked about what really matters to you when you think about aging. We also touched upon the idea of ageism and how do you define old age. Um, and it's interesting to see that most of the respondents across age groups felt that you know, it's not about retiring. It's not about turning 65. It's much more about losing independence. It's much more about inability to drive or take care of yourself. And so we are seeing a shift that people are now recognizing that age is not just defined by a number, which is important as we think about delivering services and developing programs for seniors. Uh, we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where uh, we sort of create broad buckets of needs based on somebody's age but really to address seniors, we need to think about their functional, their abilities, and their independence. We probed a little bit about you know, specific views around the current healthcare system. Uh, and overall, I would say the views are somewhat negative. You know, even in the age group that is 70 and above, only 50% felt healthcare was good or excellent. Uh, but the younger age group, the 30 to 40, only 13% felt healthcare is excellent. Uh, this is in contrast with data that you would look at if people were asked questions about their personal physician or their personal doctor. The satisfaction ratings are much closer to 70, 80, 90 percent. Uh, and this data was borne out in our survey. So we know that they're not satisfied with healthcare. We also wanted to ask them, well, we know healthcare is important. What else is important? Let's do a relative ranking of some of the other things that we think are important. And what we found is that while 80% said healthcare uh, is important to them, we also found that very close behind, almost 70% felt that in-home services, 
dental care, mental health, affordable housing, nutrition, and transportation are equally important. If you think about all the emphasis we put on healthcare, and I'm a physician, so uh, <laughs> I, I can say this, I think we focus too much on health. These other areas like dental care or in-home services and transportation are equally important if you think about a senior and their ability to successfully age and achieve their goals, uh, which helps us, uh, again, refocus our attention from our institute's perspective, uh, but also raises the conversation around what do we need to do to address the social determinants of health. We also wanted to tap into how people are changing in their views on how to access healthcare. Traditionally, healthcare has been developed and designed to be delivered from a brick and mortar environment of a hospital or a doctor's office. What we have seen in our survey is that a large percentage of people, you know, 65 to 70 percent in these responses, felt that access to care in the home, examples where medication deliveries to the home, having access to your medical record and your physician through web portals, uh, access to providers through telehealth, and even house calls, which is a model that I'm a big fan of, where doctors and nurses and providers can go to your home and take care of you, were favorably received. These numbers are in stark contrast to the actual receipt of this type of care. We know that around 1% of Medicare clients had any bills for telehealth. We know that only 10 to 12% of those people who are eligible for homebound services through house calls actually receive those, those services. We also want to touch upon optimism and, and people's feeling of optimism. Optimism is an important construct as it, it has been shown that optimism leads to better health behaviors, it leads to even better clinical outcomes and longevity. And so we wanted to tap into that phenomenon. And as you think of it, of the results, we see an inverse relationship. The younger generation was less optimistic than the older generation. Uh, this data definitely tracks and reflects on some of the other research on higher quality of life in seniors compared to younger generations. Uh, and we believe that this is an important marker of resilience that seniors are able to develop as they age. So I've touched upon some key messages and some key data points from our survey today. But I do want you to sort of go back and read more details in the handouts. But I want you to leave with three key messages that also are going to be important for us as we delve, delve into our panel discussion. It's clear that as you think about aging, there's a lot of common ground across the decades. Uh, people who are 30 and 40 are thinking along the same lines as seniors when it comes to their fears and worries about aging, which is positive. We also see that there are some tensions. There are some perceptions that are different, such as more financial worry in the young group versus more worries about independence in the older group. The second thing that I want you to take home is that people are concerned, and this is across the decades, they are all concerned about the future and how we are going to deal and provide services to a growing population of seniors. And they, they, they're not only concerned about healthcare, they're concerned somewhat more predominantly about the social services and supports and other things that need to change to allow seniors to age successfully. And then we found some great uh, examples of support for models of care that are more home and community based, that allow seniors to get services where they are versus a traditional healthcare system that focuses on the brick and mortar infrastructure of hospitals and clinics. I don't think we can build enough ERs to take care of all the seniors. We can't build enough hospitals. We have to start providing care in alternate settings. So with that, I'm gonna thank you and I'm looking forward to a great discussion with our esteemed panelists. Great, thank, thank you, you, Roger. Thank you. All right, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, first starting, I'll start at the end with Louise Hockley, our partner organization, NORC, at the University of Chicago. She's a senior researcher there. Uh, we have Julie Vizza, a producer of a really interesting documentary called 9 to 90. You have information about that documentary in your packets there. We're going to talk a little bit about that and see a little bit. Uh, of that uh, documentary, so you can see. Of course, you know Dr. Aga and Carol Raphael, who is a senior advisor at Manet Health Solutions and former board chair of AARP. Thank you, everybody, 
for coming here. And now, as Dr. Aga was talking about, it seems that America is worried. Uh, whether you're young or whether you're older, there are major concerns. Carol, are we too, are they too worried? <laughs> Well, you know, I think that it is interesting that across all these decades, one of the areas of common ground is this view that society and our nation is not well prepared to deal with the phenomenon that we're facing. I've just been reading a history book about the Constitutional Convention, and in 1790, two percent of the people were over 65 um, compared to, and, you know, the average number of children was somewhere between five and seven compared to what we face today. So, um, you know, we have created many more decades of life. And, you know, and as I think about it, um, our society is not well prepared to deal with what, in fact, medical advances and a number of public health um, initiatives have produced. And so I think that we have to really think differently about the models of support and care that will be needed in the future. I'm sure that you've heard that we've kind of moved from saving lives to prolonging lives, and we now need to move to optimizing lives. And we have a model of health care, which is very much what I call a rescue model. Um, you know, and we basically have um, an episodic transactional reactive model of health care. But then look at the fact, you know, I always find it amazing, you know, 85 percent of Medicare beneficiaries have at least one chronic condition. One-fourth of them have five or more chronic conditions. They see 13 physicians a year, and they have 50 prescriptions of medicine to fill. So you need a healthcare system that recognizes the prevalence of chronic conditions and that really helps people to live with it and helps them to monitor and avoid bad things happening and to give them, you know, kind of the freedom from the worst um, episodes of a disease as well as the freedom to live to the fullest extent that they can. And I think that's just one kind of way we need to prepare for the future. The other thing that I think we need to think about is how to have age-friendly communities that really allow people you know, to be independent. And you know, what do they mean by being independent? When I talk to people, it could be meeting their buddies to have coffee in the morning, or it could be going for a walk or driving. It could be... Um, being able to continue to have social connections and friends. And the view of aging has to change. You know, one of the things I learned at AARP that was surprising to me was the percentage of people of 65 and over who are continuing to work. Um, you know, today it's about 19%. In five years, we think it's going to be one-third. That is a big change. So people who are older are working. They're traveling. They're learning. They're going to universities. They're engaging in lifelong learning. Um, they're contributing to their communities. They are very active in arts and culture and many community organizations. So, you know, and I know we have talked about this as well. They are one of the economic engines in our society. 50% of urban consumption is attributable to people 65 and over. We talk about the longevity economy of $1.7 trillion. And so they are big consumers. And um, we really need to keep up with this changing reality in preparing. And you know, we think of older people in this one monolithic view of deterioration, loss of potential. But that is not true. They're an asset. And they contribute tremendously to their communities. And the other thing that I get particularly irked about is this view that they are technologically challenged. I just spent a day out at Facebook, and I learned that the fastest growing cohort of Facebook users That's is right. 55 and over. So we need to really change a lot of these views to make 
it for the 30s and 40s and 50 year olds in our society that they should understand that there are many roads you can travel as you age. There isn't one script. Uh, and that we need to enable people to have the affordable housing, the transportation, the in-home assistance, um, and the supports and good health care that will enable them to really continue to contribute and to, as the survey um, really indicates, retain the independence that they so cherish. Yeah, you bring up a finding of the survey uh, which talked about the things that are important to people and what they're most worried about. Now, clearly, health, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. But it goes beyond health in many ways. Dr. Aga, were you surprised in all the non-medical factors that people were concerned about as they age? First of all, wow, Carol, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think it's really important to think about beyond health, yep. Uh, Carol touched upon a lot of these areas uh, in her discussion. As we think about even achieving health outcomes, it's important to address the non-medical areas. Uh, we have learned through our work that social determinants of health, such as nutrition, uh, housing, and transportation, have a huge impact on your health care and your health outcomes. Uh, by some estimates, almost 40% of avoidable hospitals are due to a social problem, not a medical concern. Uh, so I agree with you, Roger, and I think I agree with what the survey responses are, that if you're going to improve our quality of life and support successful aging, you have to think beyond just medical doctors and nurses. You have to support seniors from multiple perspectives. Now, uh, Julie, you uh, uh, produced this documentary, 9 to 90, which follows uh, three generations mm -hmm. of an Italian-American family. It's about uh, 30 minutes, won a few awards. How do the different views of aging play <laughs> out inside a family? Well, we actually go from, all the way from the age of nine, who's my niece, <laughs> to my grandfather, who is 90. So you, you, it's almost four generations. Um, and what we found most interesting is that the nine-year-old and the 89 and 90-year-old, they speak the truth. There is, it's <laughs> unadulterated, questions asked. We want to know exactly, you know, what's going on. And I think, you know, I was turning 40 at the time that we made this, and my mom was 62, my aunt was 53. And we were the ones who were most worried. We were the ones who had, who carried all of the weight of what's going to happen, how do we do it, how do we handle it. And you know, my grandmother it was very much about her independence. Um, and for me, it was, how are we prepared for this? I don't feel like we're prepared. And trying to constantly catch up, and my mom and my aunt trying to constantly manage. And in a lot of ways, my grandparents were the ones who were most prepared. Um, and so I think in the generations, exactly what your survey says, at 30 and 40, how am I going to afford this? And for my grandmother is, no, you don't have to help me. I'm going to go do my exercises. It's time for my walk. And then I'm going to make my breakfast. Leave me alone. I'm good. I just want to know, do we have everything prepared for when we die? And how, what's going to happen next? And we were the ones who were just like, I don't know that I can handle that. How do we do this? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think your survey most like, explicitly says exactly what happened to our family. Yeah. I want to pick up on that theme with Louise, but first I want to show you a little clip of 9 to 90 so you can see uh, what Julie is talking about. Yeah, th this worked in rehearsal. Erin, could you help uh, a little you bit? Have to press it, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yes, if you don't lose it, you lose it. Oh, you're going to lose it. You is 90 years old. Do you want to do dialysis or not? Kidney failure. You understood about the dialysis, right? And who's going to take them? Me. She can't do it. You got this little girl. It's going to be OK. You know we're going to make the best decisions for you. But you got to help us out just a little bit. I've been very fortunate to have a nice family. And I do not want to be a burden to my children. All she has is uncertainty. And grandma doesn't want to be with anyone. She wants to stay on her own. She wants to maintain her independence, do things her way. Is there enough money to do it's all that? Ugh, I don't like talking about this. Mom, we... Oh, we got to talk okay. about it. Now, this is my wedding band. Why it's would you stuff. give away your wedding stuff? Well, honey, I won't be able to wear them So These are two grandchildren that I could leave it to. Is this like her passing away ceremony? I love her. 
and I'm going to keep on loving her. When you get old, it's not easy. Where can I go? So I won't be a burden to anybody. It's a hard decision to make. It really is. really is. And there's information about 9 to 90 in your folder where you can see it, how you can get it. Now, uh, Louise, in terms that we're talking about, uh, here you go. You have to follow three great speakers. Okay. I know you can do it. What I want to ask you, though, about yeah. as it relates to this, uh, you know, we see obviously there's some very close relationships that are in the documentary. We also see concerns mm -hmm. among the older generation about becoming a burden and mm -hmm. things like that. An area of focus for you is social isolation and issues related to that. How does that play out in the family? Our survey, by the way, finds out that the older we become, according to this survey, the more uh, precious those relationships are. They surpass issues as they relate to financial security. It really comes down to what's really important in life. How does that bear out in what you've studied? That's exactly right. Okay, the, next. The, the, thing that, oh, okay. <laughs> the thing that strikes me about these findings is, you know, we tout independence so much, I think at a cost. Because you get to a point in life at the end where your main concern is not being a burden, Where's the social part of that? It's like we've decided we can relinquish that and we should be able to be self-sufficient. But in reality, we're very social beings. We need each other all through life. And is there a way we can get to a point where we can admit that and structure our lives, our society, so that it's okay to be around other people, to need other people at any point in life? And we know from research that um, people who are isolated, feel lonely, uh, live less long. And there's all kinds of intermediate steps that might be contributing to that. Things like not having good control over the inflama inflammatory process in the body, um, not as good blood pressure regulation, cognition deteriorates more quickly, um, disabilities weigh in sooner, and you get institutionaliza institutionalization earlier. Um, a lot of negative health sequelae. Health behaviors de deteriorate along the way. They don't necessarily explain the effect, but it part and parcel of this um, accelerated aging and, and mortality that ultimately ensues. Um, if I can backtrack a little bit, I wanted to talk about the generational differences in the values of, that they have and just point out one psychological research finding, because I'm a psychologist, so I study these individual level processes. We need to color their, their ratings of the importance of things with um, some research that was done by Dan Gilbert on affective forecasting. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. But what t tends to happen is people overestimate how happy a positive thing will make them feel. You know, if I'm going to win the lottery, oh man, I'm going to be over the moon. And conversely, if they anticipate a loss, whether it's financial or otherwise, you know, maybe I'm going to, you're going to be a paraplegic in five years. Oh my God, my life will be impossible. I, it just will be ending right then and there. We overestimate that. When we actually get to that occasion, it isn't as bad as we thought it was going to be, and it's not as good, and it doesn't last as long as we're going to be. People who become paraplegics have a big dive in, in subject of well-being initially, but they recover, they're resilient, they, they find their way through. And I think of, of feelings of loneliness. You ask a 30 to 39 year old, um, what's the likelihood that a 60 to 69 year old, or take your older age group, is lonely? And they'll typically say, I would guess 60% of them feel lonely. You ask the 60 to 69 year old, how many of your age group do you think are lonely? They say 40%. So they're a little more realistic. Now you ask the 60 to 69 year olds, different population, let's say, how many of you are lonely? 
How many do you think? Close, 20%. Mm -hmm. So even older adults themselves overestimate how bad things are. And we have to take that into consideration. It isn't necessarily as bad as we project it to be. And we have to think about what the sources of people's information is when they answer these kinds right. of questions. Right. Um, Can I, did, I jump in with, uh, yeah. you know, because the survey uncovered worries, deep yes. concerns, yes. deep concerns about where the, whether the country is prepared, whether the things we're doing are headed in the right direction. But it doesn't stop at the country, it starts at the individual as well. Their personal aging experience, they're worried. They're worried. That's what we kept hearing from that. Yeah. Is that healthy? Is that healthy worry? <laughs> Is that justified worry? I open to you and then Carol yeah. to talk about Well, that. I think certainly there's reason to worry to some extent because we know the reality is that, there, that we don't have a net that's going to capture the needs that are there. I don't think we're capturing the range of resources we can apply to the needs that are there, and that's where we can expand. The worry, I don't think worry is ever in itself going to be terribly useful, but if we can apply that to something um, beneficial, sure, yeah, it's realistic. I still think that perceptions matter for that reason, because we act not on the reality so much as what we think the reality is. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if we think it's really bad, then maybe that's going to be a driver of action. So we talked about uh, the rising senior population. We all know that. We know the statistics. We know it's going to be doubling over the next many years. This is one of the most significant demographic shifts in United States history uh, of what's coming up. I mean, are people uh, rightly concerned meaning the 30s and the 40 and the 50 mm -hmm. range people, are they rightly concerned that their aging experience will not be as good as their parents and their grandparents? Carol? Well, you know, one of the points that was made in the survey that struck me is that when you look at 30 and 40 year olds, they don't believe that Medicare will be there for you, for them and that Social Security will be there for them. They don't have confidence that those kind of parts of the social um, infrastructure we've built will endure. And I, my dose of reality is we know that most people are ill-prepared financially for the later parts of their lives. The average American has $50,000 in you know, assets available when they sort of so-called retire, although, you know, that's becoming an outdated term as well. And there are some people who have only $1,000 in assets. Um, so they're not financially well prepared. And I think we know from millennials and their participation in the gig economy and the likelihood that they're not going to work for one employer for 25 to 30 years and have a pension, that they may even be you know, more ill-prepared financially. So their concerns about financial security, to me, are rooted in you know, reality. And then, you know, I, of course, you know, I'm very close to the field of long-term care where we know that 70% of us, 65 and over, will need long-term care at one point in our lives for different duration and of different intensity. That 70%, that is a mainstream issue. That's something we're all going to face. And you know, the average cost of a nursing home is $91,000 in the United States today. The average cost of home care now is about $40,000. So if you match the expected need with the available resources, you can see that there is a gap. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that, to me, it's not only an individual issue. It's not only a community issue. It is also a societal issue um, that we have to address at all three levels. Mm -hmm. I open this up to anyone on the panel. I mean, mm -hmm. in the survey, there was a, a three-way tie for what the top worry was, you know, in terms of developing health problems, losing your memory, that came right at the top, uh, tied with the financial security. Does that surprise anybody? Where did losing memory, why is that looming so large as in the 30s and the 40s? Why, why is that so top of mind? Go ahead, well, I Louise. Would, I would say that there's a very strong message that's pervading society. It's coming from media, it's coming from people's own experience in their family, where particularly memory is a sign of impending dementia. And dementia has a bad 
press, has bad press. I mean, it, it isn't something you would wish for anyone, but there it is. Um, so I think that's partly what explains it. I think in all those cases, though, it's what strikes me is that they all speak to independence. Because if you lose your memory, if you lose your health, if you lose your finances, how are you going to take care of yourself? Mm -hmm. It's all still related to independence. It does concern me, again, as I say that, and, and I put myself in this category, I really resonated with, you know, I don't want to be a burden to anyone. That's unfortunate. It's the reality, and that's why I think we see it coming out in this fear of all the things that might lead to being dependent, God forbid. But, you know, I think the other part of it, I have a neighbor who's a professor of mathematics, and at the age of 61, he became, um, he became cognitively impaired, and it was kind of rapid onset Alzheimer's. And I have to say, it was more shocking to me than it was to see someone who had a fall and you know has had somewhat impaired mobility because it somehow feels like he's no longer who he was. You know, I can't have a conversation with him. He doesn't recognize me. And it feels like you lose your inner essence. So to me, loss of memory is somehow at a deeper level almost. Um, than other aspects where you lose your health. And I think it strikes a deep chord in people. I think, I think the other element here is it's actually reflecting of real data. If you look at over the last two decades, uh, the big chronic diseases and even cancer, you know, both the prevalence and incidence is coming down. We're doing better. We're surviving longer with cancer. We're surviving longer with heart disease. But if you look at the data for Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it's actually getting worse. Uh, more incidents and, and survival is not getting better. The other thing that, you know, as you talk to patients, patients have, you know, been educated about how to prevent diabetes, like be healthy, you know, have exercise, don't smoke, you'll protect yourself from heart disease. They don't know what to do to protect themselves from dementia, and there isn't much we can tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's that loss of control, that loss of, like, I can't do anything about this also plays into the, uh, the fears. Right, and mm -hmm. the other thing I would just say, you know, very disappointingly, the, um, I've studied several clinical trials for new Alzheimer drugs and they all have not been successful. So we have not really been able to make any breakthroughs, you know, in terms of medications that can alleviate the condition. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Louise. So I can flip this. I was reading some stories that were that came out in a UK publication recently, trying to put a spin, a positive spin, uh, if you want to call it that, on dementias. That there is a positive side to that. There is resilience in spite of Alzheimer's and other dementias. And what struck me the most is in this, and this wouldn't be true across the whole range of severity of disease. But people with dementia, people with psychiatric diagnoses, people with physical disabilities all crave meaning, purpose, social connection. Mm -hmm. And can we think about the positive aspects of these negative aspects of aging um, and bring them to light in a way that isn't all us getting all worried and, and thinking that they're somehow out there peripheralized, we've got to do something for them. What have they got to tell us, even in whatever state they might be, that can inform how we think about care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. I, I asked the panel this, we're talking about losing memory, we're talking about uh, deteriorating health and other issues. Is there any element of ageism in this as to what we think might happen and these notions or old notions of what it is to age here in America? I mean, I just had this experience with my granddaughter. She attends an elementary school that was celebrating its centennial. And as part of its celebration, it asked all the children, and she's six years old, to come as if they were an older person. <laughs> 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 and I have to say, right. it was a very discouraging experience for me <laughs> to see at six how they had already absorbed the stereotypical views of older people as, you know, really one of decline, um, you know, or really um, not of being a burden to society in one way or another. So if they at six already, and you know, we've talked about right. the media view, and you know, we have had this conversation that when you meet with people in the media, which we have done, 
they only want to advertise and target 18 to 34 year olds and we keep trying to tell them that they're not necessarily the group that has the highest net worth and is consuming the most but it has not yet had the desired <laughs> effect and so um, they still don't target that group and I have just you know I think there are some breakthroughs you know there have been a few recent movies and um, kind of programs that have tried to show a broader view of mm -hmm. the aging population and they're having more pleasure and enjoyment and friendship. But in general, I don't think we've broken this particular glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you raise it. Well, next survey, we're going to have to do one to 10 that day, <laughs> just to find out what they think if it starts uh, really that young in terms of how we think about aging. Louise. Yeah, um, I was remembering just last year, ASA, the, when Joanne Jenkins spoke, and she had the video clip, I don't know who of you were oh, there yeah. last year, where they were breaking stereotypes, this, in essence, bringing young people to uh, a filming situation. So what do you think of an older adult? And then bring on an older adult who completely blows that stereotype exactly. out of the water. Right. It was great. Um, I do think the ageism is important, not only from the younger generation, because what happens is stereotypes get embodied early on. So you develop a stereotype as a kid, you carry that with you, and now when you're an older adult, you actually believe that implicitly about yourself, that isolation is normal, I'm not going to have friends, I'm going to be unhealthy, nobody's going to care. I mean, it, it's just sort of taken as part and parcel of mm -hmm. what it means to be old. And there's some really nice research that's looked at what, what you can do if you tweak that belief. If implicitly you get people to, this is some, you know, how psychologists do these things, really subliminal kind of priming. You <laughs> make people think about wisdom. Mm -hmm. Or you make them think about they're, being, they're decrepit. Now you measure how fast they can walk across the room. Mm -hmm. right. Becca Levy's work makes a big difference, a measurable difference. If you think of yourself, if that's been primed in you, that you're wise and not decrepit, you walk more quickly. Your memory is better. Yeah. You know, it's really quite a remarkable effect. And so I think the importance of breaking the stereotypes is not just so the young don't have those, but so that we don't raise another generation that believes those right. same stereotypes. Right. I want to remind our live stream audience, you can submit your questions and we'll take them here. And this packed room of people <laughs> who are listening to what we have to say, if you have questions, please let us know and we'll have you join our conversation or even comments. Julie, I want, I, I okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I wonder too, but Mike, for Jacqueline, who is a nine-year-old in the film, who lived with my grandmother, you know, for her whole life and still does, you know, for, when she was 10 and 11 for uh, Halloween, she would go out as an old lady, right? And she would dress up and do the whole thing. But then her, her version of that was this fierce woman who could dance, who could <laughs> sing, who had this very active life because that's who my grandmother is. Right, I mean, you know, she, <laughs> like, she does her walk like that, but, but then she's also the person who, like, you take her out and she wants to dance New York, New York with everybody who's here. Why aren't we arm in arm? And that's the person that Jacqueline sees. So I wonder, too, how much of that has to do with intergenerational living yeah. versus I only see my grandparents once a month or on Skype and this yeah. is the version I see of them. We're going there to take care of them or are they living with you? So I'm curious how that shifts the perspective even for a family, not just a younger generation. Right, so even, so and, and just so you know, you know Julie's in the film, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good. I, I want to I sort of comment on Louisa's point and, and you know, we have a, a senior center, the Gary and Mary West Senior Center in downtown San Diego. And we have lots of seniors, vulnerable seniors, who come to that in a situation like you described, where they don't have self-confidence to begin with. They feel you know, bad about themselves. Yeah. But once they access the services, whether it's the yoga or the dance class, or they get a new smile through a dental treatment, they have a positive outlook on life. And we have some really good ambassadors from the senior center that we have videoed and, and are on our website. It's life-changing to see them go from being shy and sort of lack of confidence yeah. to these fully vibrant, successfully aging seniors. And all they needed was that opportunity to sort of gain that confidence. You know, I've been to the Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center, and I must say, I've never seen more life in a building than I uh, have seen anywhere else with the uh, people who are aging. And really, uh, I think as the survey points out, it's not all bad. 
It's not all bad. People are optimistic, or generally more optimistic, as we were talking about. And uh, Dr. Aga, you talk about the optimism in terms of, and Carol said too, a resilience that uh, older people seem to have as they age. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think resilience is, again, it's a psychological phenomena or quality that has been very well studied. Um, uh, it, and it has been proven that if you have resilience and optimism, uh, you're not only better able to cope and manage your life, you're actually going to have better health outcomes, better health behaviors like quit smoking or start engaging in exercise, uh, which then has direct benefits on, on your longevity. Uh, We've even uh, you know, started looking at resilience in a younger age group. Uh, and I used to work at the VA, PTSD. They were looking at veterans who suffered from PTSD versus those who did not. And resilience was a key factor uh, in those people who had a protective effect. So resilience can have tremendous protective effects uh, on us and our psychological well-being, but also our physical well-being. And you know, the other things that I've noted is there are some surveys, and Louise, you can probably jump in here, you probably are closer to them than I am, that have showed more contentment um, as people age, and whether it's sort of being able to separate the wheat from the chaff and understanding what's consequential and not really allowing yourself to worry and fret about things you can't control or that you know, pass over time. Um, you know, and I think someone made the point that you kind of begin to also recognize the value of your family and your friends and your social circle. Um, so I think that for a variety of reasons, older people do exhibit more contentment and serenity. Mm -hmm. Your uh, grandparents have that, right? Yeah, and I think, well, actually, my grandparents were very different. My grandmother was the social bug and my grandfather I think definitely suffered from mental illness um, and depression and had a hard time getting out of bed and taking care of his um, diabetic needs and things like that. And so my grandmother, I think part of her decision was, you know, here I am, I, like, I can still take care of myself to some degree, I know I need care, but here's someone who can't um, and how much can I do to get, make him get up to take his medication and do these things. And so for her, part of the decision was, how do I live out the rest of my life in a happy way, in a way that I can still enjoy, versus here's someone who really doesn't know how to, even mm -hmm. if he wanted to. Right. Um, so I think there was that, there was very much a difference between the two of them. Yeah. How, how has their aging experience changed you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky. I mean, my grandmother is um, a force to be reckoned with. I was going to say earlier that at the time of making the film, my grandparents had everything prepared. They knew exactly what they wanted when it was time for them to give up their home, what they needed to do, how they were going to die, what they were going to do in terms of what happened after they passed. My parents were in the midst of that, and I had not started it at all. And what it made me realize is how unprepared I really was and how scared I was of being able to start that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that it made me do was realize it's not that bad to talk about. It. And I just need to start talking about it and say what it is that I want and that it can change and it's okay for that to happen. But as long as my family and I were part of that conversation, that was the biggest. And I had people, I'm very fortunate. I have my family who loves me and, we love, and they love me back. So there was a space for that to happen within, but I didn't recognize that until I was in that situation. Mm -hmm. And reminder, we'll, we'll take questions if, if there are. Uh, but I, I want to ask and open it to the panel, which says the caregiving experience is a very important part of the aging experience. And I'm just wondering, how much does our caregiving experience affect our views on aging? Louise. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it does. I don't. I can't give you chapter and verse <laughs> research. I just know that caregiving has its own costs and benefits, and I think probably that's an area that's ripe for more work as we think about how to deal with older people in the future. We have a shrinking geriatric workforce. We need to think about other ways of providing needs. And caregivers can be formal or informal, but let's say they're informal. Let's say they're a family member. All power to your grandmother, but should she have to give up her life to take care of his needs, she may choose to do that. But can we support her enough that she has some richness and fullness and purpose in life? So I just think that's a direction we have to explore more completely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would love to see work done on caregivers feeling guilt for not being able to constantly take care of every need. And I think there's so much pressure of, especially with informal, with family caregivers, of 
how come we had to make the decision we had to make, even though this was the decision my grandparents made? Mm -hmm. You know, what, you know, how do we sort of take care of the caregiver in that process? Right. Even, even from personal experience, you know, it, the, the sacrifice is there, but also is the joy of uh, being able to help somebody that you really care about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just related, I was thinking of the, the other side of that, and that is the conflict that can arise in the relationship between the caregiver and the care receiver and what one might be able to do about that with that. I think, yes, guilt is a big thing. I think probably in those individual settings, but more generally in our society, we have to be cognizant that caregiving isn't just something we do for other people. We have to think about what's really needed, wanted here. Maybe we're going out of our way, killing ourselves, providing the kind of care that that other person really doesn't want. <laughs> right, so it always, back to the central thesis of this survey, what matters most? What matters most and is what we looked at. And understanding <laughs> what matters most. And then trying to address what matters most. Now I want to turn to the panel and talk about, you know, we talked, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of concern. What can we do? What are the <laughs> models of care of tomorrow that ensure that we are, A, better prepared and B, heading in the right direction and C, doing it in such a way that we're helping the individual aging experience. Carol. Well, you know, just um, I guess two points here. First of all, going back to the caregivers, I mean, we do have, you know, depending on the data, about 40 million caregivers in, in, at any one point in this country, which is quite phenomenal. And the other surprise for me was that 40% are men. Um, and that mm -hmm. it has, you know, a very, very definite effect on the life of the caregiver, their employment and financial situation, their mental health and their physical health. And so I don't think yet we have found a way to kind of support those caregivers. I think there's <laughs> growing awareness that the whole kind of system of in-home support rests on their shoulders, but I don't think yet we have developed um, models that really make it easier for them to do what they do, to, you know, recognizing that there's a real melange of emotions involved in that um, role. The other thing I'm very interested in is models that could be more intergenerational. Um, you know, one of the few that I've seen that's really been studied empirically has been Experience Core where you have older um, people in their community going into elementary schools. And the results seem to me to be very powerful because first of all, the schools which are perpetually underfunded had a workforce that they didn't generally have. And they had older people who were scientists and who could teach science or music um, that wasn't available anymore in the curriculum with cutbacks. But um, the students made discernible progress in learning. Um, and additionally, the older people's health status improved dramatically. And they were able to make social connections with others who were working with them at the school. So I'm not saying that's you know, a unitary model, but I think we need to think about more intergenerational models uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to questions from the audience. Uh, so thank you. I, I see a, lot of, uh, a number of questions. I just want to ask one more question, Dr. Aga, which is going back to these models of care. Now, you have yeah. some experience in trying to figure out what these models of care and these care models go beyond medical care. Yes. I think it's very clear that we can't prescribe our way out of this problem. Yeah? I think we have to think beyond just medical prescriptions. Uh, that's clear. Uh, what we really need to work towards is a, like you said, you know, a multidisciplinary system that's holistic and can surround the seniors with all the services that they need. Now, these services need to come from the communities where seniors live. This is not something that's going to be provided by healthcare entities or systems. So I think partnering and working with local community agencies is really important. Even in our survey, we found that Religious institutions were as valued, in fact, twice as valued in terms of supporting seniors than the healthcare system. I think we need to address multidisciplinary team-based models of care that are aligning with the goals of an aging population. So 
you know, our work around palliative medicine or home-based primary care, which are clinical models, but are interdisciplinary. They involve a very strong <laughs> emphasis on social work uh, and supportive systems. Uh, they need to be you know, supported and, and they need to grow. And in terms of you know, engaging seniors, and we talked about caregiving. In our survey, we found that it is mostly the seniors who are the caregivers. So we need to build systems and models that support these seniors to be uh, both good caregivers for themselves so that they maintain their own health, but also they can take care of their loved ones. Like you said, 40 million uh, caregivers are doing a tremendous service, yet we don't do too much to support them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are some of the areas. And then at the national level, you know, health policy has an important, important aspect in supporting our programs that are designed for seniors and advancing them. All right. Uh, you've been listening so well. You seem so engaged. I want to give our audience a chance to ask some questions. If we have the microphone. Say who you are and your background and then the, the question. My name is Mandy Arnold. I am from Maryland. I'm with Partners in Care, a nonprofit organization, but I have a medical background. And with you guys being in research, my question is based on dementia. Has there been any research around statin drugs and the symptoms and signs and symptoms of dementia? And if it has, is because we're now taking cholesterol medication so regularly, is that the reason for the increase? Yeah. Uh, so you remind me of a colleague uh, by the name of Beatrice Gulum. You should look her up. Uh, she has done some really fantastic research to uh, link the use of statins in, uh, in an older age group with uh, incidence of dementia. So there are concerns, and I think these are real concerns. Uh, I think what's also really important is for us to understand that as we think about treating chronic diseases, especially in the elderly population, we cannot assume that the data we collected in clinical trials, which mostly have young populations, will translate both in terms of efficacy but also safety profiles. Um, as a primary care provider, we are often assuming that, well, what worked for a 55-year-old, it's the same disease and the same drug. Let's use it in an 85-year-old. So I think that's a very valid point that you bring up, and, and there are serious concerns about the appropriateness of statin therapy in that age group. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Go ahead. Who uh, you are? Eileen Tell with ET there. Consulting, and I focus on helping families do long-term care planning, anything from a conversation to actually buying or doing something. Um, I'm struck with the what you described about the contact that you had with family and the impact, positive impact that had. Probably, if your nine-year-old was in the survey, she might have a more optimistic view of what life will be like for her at 60 than uh, someone who didn't. And with long-distance families and everything, I wonder if there was anything in the survey that looked at people's connection and exposure to multiple generations and whether that influenced their optimism about what those stages mean, because it's a lot easier to be afraid of something you don't see than if you see it. That's, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I don't think we had a specific <coughs> question that looked at that element. Uh, we did ask uh, specific questions around who do you think is going to be there to provide you with care or services. Uh, the older generation felt it was going to be their friends and family and loved ones uh, and, and are almost you know, uniformly. Uh, the younger generation was in somewhat of a denial and they felt that they themselves will take care of them, uh, their needs. Uh, and they would not rely on outside uh, support. Uh, but that's a, that's a very interesting observation that you make and, and, and even more relevant because our families are now living on two different coasts often uh, and that has a huge, huge impact. All right, we have time for one last question. Go ahead. My name is Elizabeth White and I'm the author of a new book called 55 Unemployed and Faking Normal. And I wanted to build on uh, Carol's point about the number of boomers who are woefully unprepared for retirement and what's really going to happen. So when you look at 29% a, um, a of 55 to 64-year-olds have not saved a dime. And you look at the median value of the retirement account, it's something like $100,000, which is a, uh, you know inflation-protected annuity of $300 a month. So what is actually going to happen to people in a we-don't-want-you workforce? Uh, they're working, but many people are not 
are facing a work for life proposition in an environment where they're not going to be able to work because of all these chronic conditions, et cetera. And we've got millions of people who are following in this category. And I'm just wondering, kind of as a society, how are we going to deal with this? Who wants to take that one real quick? Well, we only have a little bit of time. Carol, Carol, everybody's pointing to you. Go I ahead. Mean, one thing that AARP was promoting was 52% of Americans who work don't have a vehicle for saving, like, you know, a 403B, a 401K. So they were promoting work and save, which would be a way for the state to kind of be the administrator of a, of a fund. And if you start when you're 21, you don't have to put a lot into it. And the way that we had shaped it was that you're in it unless you opt out, yes. sort of based on behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was something that we thought would painlessly help people to begin to prepare for their future. And it did pass in Illinois. Yes, it did. All right. Thank you. I want to just uh, thank you, audience, for some uh, great questions and being attentive while we did all this. So thank you very much. I want to acknowledge uh, Shelley Leifert, who is president and CEO of West Health, celebrating 10 years now. Tim Lash, chief strategy officer of West Health, uh, driving forces behind the survey and these findings and its analysis. Thank you all, panel. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions from the live stream, but go to westhealth.org and you can submit comments and questions and we'll try to answer them there. Thank you for being here.